everybody. Thank you so much for your support of the Cosmic Chats, for your attention and your energy, and just being a part of each episode. It makes all the difference. So if you haven't subscribed before, please consider doing so. The more subscribers that we can get, the wider the net that we can cast, and the more and more people that we can bring in to share their insights, consciousness, and wisdom, and reveal that in the universe for all of us. So thank you so much and have a great day. Um, if anybody doesn't know, you probably know me, but my name is Debbie Sugarbaker, and I have a podcast called The Cosmic Chats with Debbie Sugarbaker Podcast. It's available on all the major platforms, including Spotify, which is my personal favorite. And I also do my conversations as lives on Instagram. So tonight, I'm so excited to be joined here. I already gave him a brief introduction before you came on, Eliao. But this is Eliao Kraus. He is a martial artist. He works with children, and he wrote this book called How to Be a Ninja of Life, which we're going to be talking about tonight because I think that, first of all, the book is amazing for kids. So if anybody is looking for a good Thank gift you. for the holidays or you know, birthday to give to a child, this is a beautiful book, and it's beautifully written and beautifully um, illustrated as well. And there's so many good things inside. So check it out. And we'll get started. Thank you. So, Elia, is there anything you wanted to add? Um, a little bit about yourself, maybe, beyond what I've shared? Sure. So, I, uh, I was in the Israeli army for several years, and then I worked in the security services in Israel and studied Arabic and Islam and tried to see you know, what we could do over there in terms of um, bridging gaps, um, both economically and in terms of security. And then I moved to LA about three years ago, and I continued teaching martial arts, just like I did in Israel. And I noticed that the young kids, it was really hard to teach them techniques, because you try to tell them, you know, hold your hand here and your other hand here, and they just, they're bored because it's hard for them to focus. So instead of telling them, hold your left hand here and hold your right hand here, I said, once upon a time, there was a boy named Goro, and he would put one hand here and one hand here. And the second I turned it into a character, they were able to, they were just watching me the whole time. And I would do voices and I would do different things. And that inspired me to write a book where I can just teach martial arts through stories. So the stories have um, different martial arts techniques, but they also have life lessons. For example, the first one is um, self-control, and then appreciation, and then self-confidence. Uh, responsibility is one of them. Uh, removing distractions from your vicinity. There are just, there are a lot, there are 10 different, here I have the book right here. Uh, there are 10 different stories, and if I open up to the table of contents, uh, you could see that there are, you know, 10 different stories. Each of the stories, it has, uh, is it backwards? It's probably backwards for you guys. But the idea is that it, it has um, the name of the story and then the lesson that's attached to that story. And there are some characters that repeat themselves in different stories so that you kind of get to enjoy uh, the character development and things like that. So that inspired me to write the book. I wrote the book and I use the book in my classroom and I teach, uh, kids and adults. And the book is actually, I know it looks like a children's book, but if you, in the vision of the book, it says that it's a family book. The idea is to open dialogue between parents and teachers and children about different um, topics like self-control, impulsivity. Um, and it's supposed to open these dialogues so that they can kind of talk about it through the story. I'm a father of two children also, and I, one of my children, he has a little bit of difficulty with flexibility. If something doesn't go his way, then it's very hard for him to be right. flexible. So sometimes I'll... Right. So sometimes I'll tell a story about my son, 
but I'll call him a different name. And then my son is able to see it from an objective point of view instead of seeing the situation from just himself and subjective and he defends himself. Instead of having him defend himself, I talk about my son, but I call him another name. So my son is able to see it through these objective lenses and it actually helps him deal with the situation better. And this technique is used with adult uh, psychology and therapy as well. I have some therapist friends and I asked them, I, I told them about this technique and they said that it's actually a common technique that's used. Wow. That's so powerful. So, yeah. Actually, I've used that in my lifetime when I had to go through really hard things. Oh. I just imagined myself as like a character in a movie. And like, I gave her like mm. a lot of strength and energy to go through like the difficulty. And I'm, sometimes if you just pull yourself out of it, it gives you a, a different kind of just that different perspective can totally change things. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I'm just looking here and the, the lessons are amazing, like respect and don't make fun. Appreciation goes a long way. And these are the lessons that are within the stories. Um, patience and caution can beat speed. Um, competition with yourself. That's huge for kids to be learning these days because they're now they're growing up in the social yeah. media world. And it's like, you know, a totally different reality than, for example, how we grew up. I'm not saying one is better or worse than the other, but you know, these lessons are really incredible. And for someone, for children to be like already getting these, le getting these as, you know, young, at a young age. Mm. So, um, and I also saw in here that you had like each of the characters has a favorite um, animal. And you also give some information like Sapphire is the, stone associated with September. Can you just talk a little bit about why you decided to include animals and like gemstones? Because my, my listeners sure. would probably really like that. <laughs> we love <laughs> Yeah, for sure, for sure. So every character has a spirit animal and it helps to bring the character to life. And when, when we read the book, like, again, I'll say that the, the book was intended for parents or teachers to read with their children together. So when they talk about the spirit animal, it kind of brings the character to life in a different way. Like Haru, his spirit animal is a bear. And if you follow the stories, he has a little bit of trouble with bullying. He's a little bit of a bully. And uh, the bear is supposed to just bring that to life in a different way. And he deals with his bullying. Um, for example, uh, two of the characters are different types of snakes. And so they're both snakes, but different types of snakes, just to show us that nobody's the same. You know, everybody's a little bit different. Everybody's special in their own way. And everybody has different ways to express themselves. Even myself, some people know me as a very serious person. And some people know me as a jokester who, you know, does imitations and um, improv. So it, that's just different ways that I like to express myself. And I, I want it to be understood that that's okay. It's okay to have different animals. You don't have to be exactly like everyone else. And even two people that are similar are still special and unique in their own way. Uh, in regards to the, the sapphire, so at the end of every chapter, I have activities. I have life lessons. I have um, did you know, food for thought. And then what did you learn? And by the what did you learn, there's a space. And you could actually write in the book. And then you could give it to someone else. And they can read it and write their own thing in the book. So it becomes a dialogue. It becomes something that's perpetuated, that continuously develops. So one of the did you knows was about sapphires because the story was about someone buying a stone for his wife or his, uh, uh, yeah, it was his wife. Um, but there's something very beautiful in birthstones. Um, I'm, for, you know, of the Jewish faith. And in the Jewish faith, there is the breastplate of the Kohen Agadol, the high priest. And each, there are 12 stones. And each stone represents another tribe, but also another month and another power. Each birthstone has its own power, its own color, its own flavor, so to speak. And I wanted to bring that out as, again... 
Exactly. Yeah. So it's all that stuff together. Wow, it's so cool. Yeah. I love it. And um, thank you. So what would you say, like, if you, you know, how to be a ninja of life? Like, is there one of the lessons if you were going to like, just, you could probably give lectures, you know, you I know you work with kids all the time, but you also I've also heard you speak, you know, with adults and teach adults. So if there is like, one lesson that you would share about how to be a ninja of life like for people who are going we're all going through challenges of different sorts is there one lesson or one thing that like really can give a person you know from your perspective strength that's a beautiful question um the one thing that i would say is and i i, I have several adult uh, personal clients and teachers and it's good for uh, I mean, students, it's good for um, children and adults, what I'm about to say, which is, I think the key to being a ninja of life is to start with a step that is so easy that there's no excuse not to do it. For example, I tell my adult uh, clients that I train, you know, in physical fitness and martial arts, when they wake up in the morning, stretch for 10 seconds. So 10 seconds is something that there's no excuse not to do 10 seconds, you know what I mean? But then they start with 10 seconds and they want more. So it's kind of like a trick that you play on your own mind and then it brings you to do more and more and more. So the lesson is start with a step, whatever it is that you want to do. Some people want to write more. Some people want to exercise more. Some people want to read right. more. Whatever it is, start with 10 seconds of it. That's the life lesson for everyone. Oh, I love it. Because most people then find, you know, you, you work out once. Let's say you don't work out all the time, but then you go to a yoga class or you do something and you feel amazing. Like, oh, I want to do this every day. And then you get to the day and then you're like, you just didn't do it for whatever reason. All those reasons come up. So I really like this approach because you can kind of basically bring your – it's a way to build yourself into anything, any desire that you really want to have in your life um, or habit, etc. Exactly. And to add on to that, if I may, is we need to celebrate our victories. And when we quote unquote fail, don't get stuck in it. So let's say one day, you know, you did 10 seconds of stretching, which turned to 30 seconds the next day, et cetera, et cetera. And then one day you missed it. Don't say, oh, I missed it. That's it. It's all over. No. Notice that you missed it and just do it the next day. And if you don't do it the next day, okay. So do it the next day. The key is to not get stuck. A lot of us get stuck and it's mostly just our way of thinking or the people are surrounded by. The key is to just push forwards. Don't ever get stuck. Don't let yourself. That's the most dangerous thing is getting wow. stuck. I love that. Yeah, there's two aspects of that that came into mind, which I've kind of dealt with myself, which is sometimes like something will go wrong or I'll get so frustrated with like a small thing and then I just like make it into something huge. Someone just told me today, you should really think about proportion, like how, you know, how, how things in life should be like, in, like think about them in proportion, like whatever happened really wasn't a big deal, but I turned it into a big deal, like overreacting. Mm. So that's one thing. So I really like how you said that, like really just taking things, any little failure or whatever, don't let it get you down, just keep going. And the other thing that I've been mm -hmm. thinking about is like when you know that you have to do something, whether it's, you know, a creative pursuit or a project or a new business or whatever it is, if you know in your heart that you have to do it, a lot of times I find that I get people around me who are, a bit skeptical or like, eh, what are you really doing? Or what's that? Especially in the beginning. And I think that that's really an important point to like kind of be able to drown out voices of doubt or skepticism. I'm not saying that you don't have to listen to other people or take advice or whatever, but if you really know that there's something that you need to do that will benefit other people, that could be a project, like I said, business, whatever it is, and you know in your heart that it's for you, like, stay with it because usually the way the, the way usually opens because of our energy of staying with it it opens that way so those are just two amen to that yeah and um so yeah there's just 
so many things about this, about this book and about your work. I know about the martial arts, you do um, something called Krav Maga, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's like a mixture of um, Aikido and like different martial arts, right? I could talk about it a little bit. Yeah, so my academy, it's Richmond, and we have a website and a blog and, and different interesting content on it. Um, we focus on the three pillars, which are uh, spirituality, music, and martial arts. Um, so those are the three pillars that I, I teach uh, in an elementary school. I teach full-time, and then after school, I have my own private clients, but it's the same three pillars. So it's these, it's the balance of, you know, the martial arts is supposed to represent your physical discipline. The music is kind of the bridge between the physical and the spiritual. And I'll talk more about that in a second. And then the spirituality, whether it be, you know, serving God or whatever it is for whoever it is, that's the spirituality. Um, but if I just talk about the martial arts, it's a mixture of ninjutsu, uh, jujitsu, and uh, Muay Thai. That's what I study and teach. And the differences are that uh, Muay Thai is a lot of punches and kicks and knees and elbows. It's standing fighting. That's mostly strikes. Ninjutsu is a lot of psychological warfare. It's a lot of um, what you project, how to de-escalate situations. Because we don't want to really ever get into a fight even if you beat the other guy, you're usually hurt, they're hurt, there's usually legal issues, there's property damage. So the best situation is always to prevent a fight. Like I think it was Buddha actually that said, or maybe Sun Tzu or maybe both, that the best victory is one where you never have to raise your hand. That's the best victory. So that's the ninjutsu aspect, is that uh, there are also a lot of locks, uh, like wrist locks, arm locks. And then the jujitsu aspect is the throws and the ground fighting and the submissions. So it's a blend of all of them, which takes you from standing to grappling while you're standing to the ground. And it tries to cover all the aspects of, uh, of a fight. And it's a lot about learning your own power and your own energy and how to harness it and the truth is, someone told me this a long time ago, is that jujitsu, it really means the art of soft. It means the soft art. Because you're, you're trying to not hurt the person or at least de-escalate the situation and neutralize the, the enemy with the least amount of force and the least amount of damage. Right. Like I was a soldier. I was a soldier in the, in the paratroopers in Israel for several years. And I was talking about a situation one time that happened where there were some uh, people that were transferring explosives and they were trying to bring the explosives to an engineer to put them together. And then he was supposed to give it to a, a 19 year old and that 19 year old was supposed to blow us up. We were on, on duty guarding an area, keeping it safe. And we caught the, the guy that was on his way to bring the explosives to the engineer and he was going to come back and kill us. And we actually got him on the way. We intercepted him. So someone Sorry, asked me, no, they're like, no. so did you shoot him? Did Sorry, you... Excuse me. It's my dog. No, it's fine. Your dog. So no. someone asked me, they're like, did you shoot him? Did you shoot him? And I was like, I chuckled. I'm like, you're so cute and naive. But the truth is that if you shoot a person, that's it. It's over. There's no more good that can come out of that situation but if you if you arrest the person and you bring him into interrogation and then you get information out of him you could potentially ar arrest a lot of bad guys and save a lot of lives so the point is that a lot of people we watch a lot of movies and we watch a lot of tv so we assume that every time there's a bad guy you shoot them and that's it but that's not the truth. The truth is that you want to try to de-escalate the situation, get information out of them with the least amount of force possible, 
necessary so that you could prevent more violence. And that's, uh, in a nutshell, I guess that's what we believe in the Academy of Enrichment. Wow, that's really powerful. I love it. And I'm so sorry about my dog. He's, he's getting, it's okay. He's excited he's, too. He's getting aggressive because basically what happened is my neighbor's dog went after him. It's actually interesting one night and now he can't really forget about it and he has this fear and so every time that the dog is around he gets like really afraid and barking but and he's actually gone after it wow. but the dog's much bigger than him so it's better if he actually practices what you just said and doesn't attack <laughs> directly exactly exactly but I really love it, when we're talking you know, about bullies i was gonna say when we're talking about bullies this is story number three in my yeah. book um, it's called A Night in the Forest, is about how to deal with bullies and bigger opponents. And the number one thing that I've seen, practically I've seen at work many times, is that bullies are usually looking for easy and soft targets. So the second you show them that their work is not going to be easy, it already deters them. Right. Well, this is so interesting, exactly what you're saying. Because I was thinking, when you were talking about when you were talking about um, the whole idea of kids learning this kind of self-defense and learning how to manage their energy and, and focus their energy and put it towards something, I was thinking, I wish I had learned this as a little girl because just internally, mm. just to realize, like to have that really strong sense of self and a really strong sense of your own energy and your own ability, <laughs> does it mean that you're gonna use it? This is like really driving me crazy. I have to be a ninja right now because I think what, outside no. my door it's like oh my god okay <laughs> so, anyway now I need to energy. <laughs> so basically what i'm right. saying is like i wish that i had learned it as a little girl because now i'm starting to realize like how important it is to have for example boundaries to know boundaries with people to know when to say no how to say no to be able to i mean that's a huge one Many people go through life, like, we learn, like, we want to be nice, we want to be kind, we learn those things, but we don't learn about, like, managing our own energy and boundaries and how to, like, bring ourselves up, you know? We kind of, like you said, if you're, if you're always, like, so submissive, you're more likely to be bullied. Now, I'm not saying that sensitivity is a bad thing or empathy or being an empath, because I would say that most of my life I've been an empath, but recently I've really had to learn through... Uh, relationships that were like really imbalanced like you know I was like the other person was you know very strong in one way and I was very strong in the other way I learned oh I need to balance my energy more you know in order to be more effective mm -hmm. in the world like of course I, I don't want to lose the heart and the softness but I also want to have a sense a different sense of myself and how I can manage my energy and my boundaries with people and to let people know that they can't step on me basically Right. So there are a few tips that we talk about in Academy of Enrichment. And there's a really simple thing that we don't, we don't think about it. And I only recently discovered this maybe two years ago, which is there's a few words that you could say that are so powerful, which are, ready? Let me think about it. Someone asks you a question. We're used to, oh, I have to say yes or no. Yes right. or no. How about say, let me think about right. it. Or an another thing that we use a lot is, I don't feel comfortable with that. So instead of, you don't have to say no and seem like the bad guy. You could say, I don't feel comfortable right. with that. That's one, let me think about it. That's another really good one. And another one is, let's say you wanna say no, or you're not sure if you wanna say no. You can say, not right now or maybe later, those are interchangeable. Not right now, I mean, not right now, it could also mean not later, but not right now for sure, I know not right now, maybe later, and then you actually give yourself, it's, a, it's called a pause, right, you know that term, a yes. pause? So this is a, for, this is a form of a pause. All of those that I just said are a form of a <laughs> pause that you could then give yourself time to ask yourself, wait, is this against my boundaries? Is this something that I want, something that I don't right. want? So let me go over them again. Um, not right now, not right now. maybe later, which are really interchangeable. I don't feel comfortable.
comfortable right. with that. Or let me think about it. Let me think about it is so powerful. Wow. Anyway. I love that because I love the idea of a pause also. If anybody probably who will watch this video studies Kabbalah, one of the first things that we learn in any situation where you feel like you want to react, you pause. The first step is just to pause. Mm -hmm. And in that space of the pause, like Viktor Frankl said, the space between, um, what is it? React, uh, Action stimulus and, and response is where like basically where the magic, the choice and the magic happens. Because in that space, mm -hmm. in that pause, then we actually get to choose. If we don't have the pause, right? If I just react, then I'm basically just like being robotic. I'm just going according to my reactive nature, right? But as soon as I instill the pause, then I have a choice and I basically activate my more creator nature, let's say, and I can say, huh, let's see if I really want to do that. What do I really want? And then I'm connected to my own sense of beingness, my own desire, my own whatever it is. So especially mm -hmm. like in the situation that we said, like, let's say, you know, your person has a hard time saying no. So if somebody presents something or you're a people pleaser and your reactive nature is to be like a people pleaser, right? And to put yourself like not to disregard yourself in a way. So you, you inject the pause, like you said, maybe later, and then you get to really tap into your own creative nature, your own real desire and figure out what you want to do. So it's kind of cool because it's yeah. super capitalistic also. So. It is Kabbalistic and it's related to music. If I just may add one more idea with this is that in music, Victor says, I don't know if you heard of Victor Rutten, he's a famous musician and a music teacher. He has a, a big music camp. And he says that the groove is not created by the notes that you're playing, but by the spaces between the notes. Wow. Did you get that? Yeah. Yeah. That's like one of the most powerful things I've ever heard. Wow. I know that you're also a musician too, so. Yeah. If anybody is interested yeah, so or that's a good one. I like the that. Robertson area, sometimes he performs, so can DM me and I'll let you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, yeah. well is there Thank anything you. else that you feel like we should share on this live? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think the book is very, very powerful, and I think it's appropriate for all ages. It's available on Amazon, and if anyone lives in my area, I have copies that I could inscribe and, uh, and dedicate to you guys. Um, I really believe in the book. I think it's, you know, even if we're talking about pause, that's story number one. Story number one explicitly discusses pause. Um, and they're all very, very powerful stories, and they're good for all ages. And um, it's not just kids that need to develop and grow. You know, Abraham was like 75, I think, when he left, uh, when he started going towards Israel. Rabbi Akiva was 40 when he started learning Aleph Bet. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's never ending, our journey in this world. So I love that. Our journey is definitely never ending. And it, but if there is one thing, is there anything else that you think that, you know, parents can share with their kids or we can share with each other? Any last idea that you would say? Right. That's it. Um, positivity. So if you, let's say you don't want your kid to make so much noise. Yeah. So instead of saying, stop making noise, tell them what they should be doing. Right. Can, can you play a little bit more quietly? Right. Can you play a little bit more quietly is a lot more powerful than don't make noise. Right. If kids hear, and adults, by the way, this is for adults too, nobody wants to hear negativity all day long, and you can say almost everything in a positive way. And we grow up, <laughs> whoever it is, even yourself, even yourself, when you're talking to yourself, it's so powerful to educate yourself or your friends or your kids what they can do, because if children are hearing all day long, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, what, what can I do? What is there left to do? So in my, my students, as, as much as I can, I obviously slip up, but instead of saying, don't do that, I say, can you please do this? Show them an alternative. 
for yourself, for your friends, for everyone. That's, I think, very powerful. I love it. Thank you so much, Eliel, for joining me. <laughs> Everybody, check out the book, How to Be in Thank a Good you. Life. Again, it's not just for kids. It's for families, for, for even adults. Even I was reading it, and I, I even learned things for myself. And sometimes the way that things are presented for children, and then when it's presented for it, you read it as an adult. It's like, oh, it's so simple. You know, it's so simple and just gets you right where you need to receive it. So thank you so much, Eliel, for joining me again. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And I hope you have a beautiful evening. Thank you so much, Debbie. I loved it. Thank, oh, you. thank you. Take care.